Coming up on this week's show is the PS5 getting backwards compatibility. Dominic Diamond tells us about his new Games Master book. And we talk about cloning the Commodore 64 and more with 8-Bit Show and Tell. The Retro Hour podcast is brought to you each week with our wonderful friends at Bitmap Books. Now, you need to check out the Atari 2600 and 7800 visual compendium showing the very best pixel art cover art and product design of each system spread over a massive 528 pages and featuring over 200 classic games as well as interviews and articles on leading developers and key figures in the industry. You can check that out and more on their website at bitmapbooks.co.uk. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 269, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And welcome to this week's bumper show, where we've got so much to cram into the uh, next hour-ish. I did actually see a message on our YouTube channel last week. A guy's like, you need to rename the show, lads. You know, you need to call it like, you know, the, the, the retro one hour, 25 minutes, but it doesn't quite have the same ring that, does it? You know what? It's funny because if <laughs> sometimes, like, the, literally, we end up recording like two and a half hours worth of stuff, don't we? And it's just like, <laughs> you're just there like, lads, like we've yammered on about so much stuff. Like, <laughs> you know, I've had to, I've got it down to an hour and 40, but it's still long. But literally this, this week, we've got so much to talk about, haven't we? If 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 we did more, it would become the retro two hour, then the retro four hour, and it would just go <laughs> on forever. <laughs> no one's got time for that. Um, but yeah, this week we've got so much to cram into the show. Not only are we going to be bringing you up to speed with all of the retro gaming headlines from the last week, and it's been a really busy week for news. Also, we're going to be joined by two guests on this week's show as well, because um, <laughs> this keeps happening to us recently. The minute we finish recording an episode a major news headline drops. This has happened, I think, the last two weeks now. And, uh, of course, the big story last week was that Dominic Diamond is bringing out a book all about his time on Games Master. How hyped are we for this? Oh, really hyped. And, you know, Dom's going to come on the show and tell us all about it and, you know, tell us about the new Games Master Channel 4 series and just see what's happening there. Yeah, because, I mean, there's been lots of rumours, obviously, about, you know, a Channel 4 reboot of Games Master, and everyone's been asking the question, is Dominic Diamond going to be involved in that? So um, we're going to ask him about that, haven't we? So he's going to be on in the next 10 minutes or so, and then we're going to be going inside the world of cloning the Commodore 64 with Robin Habron from the 8-Bit Show and Tell channel on YouTube. Now, that channel is absolutely awesome. It is amazing. And, you know, this was suggested by a listener in one of our show suggestions on Discord. And yeah. I, I'd not really checked out his channel. Then when I did and I spoke to Robin, I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe what you've been involved with. So he was involved with uh, years ago before all of these clones came out and uh, a person turned up at his event and it was a girl. Oh, my God. And she was into Commodore 64 and she was making what? A Commodore 64 on a chip. And that was Jerry Ellsworth, and she created the uh, C64 Direct to TV. So that was mm. one of the first ones of these kind of C64 clones. And Robin was lead programmer with that, but also he's worked with the C64 Mini. And he's got a huge collection. We talk all about his kind of youth in Canada as well, and he's a real Commodore fanboy, isn't he? Yeah, he's got the most incredible collection. And even, you know, stuff like um, finding Commodore 64 programs hidden on albums, which, you know, was a video that he did that blew up and actually made the headlines on quite a few mainstream tech sites a year or two back. Um, So definitely worth checking out the channel. Robin, just such an interesting guy. Um, If you're a fan of Commodore machines, we're going to really get geeky with him. Robin Habron, our special guest on the Retro Hour podcast in around 20 minutes from now. Now, there is lots of news stories to get through, including this uh, rumour that apparently Sony are going to be bringing PlayStation 1, maybe 2 and 3, backward compatibility to the PS5. This amazing new online streaming service for retro games that we'll talk about in just a moment. But before we do, let's give a massive thank you to One of our sponsors this week, this is The Incredible Curve. Now, obviously here in the UK, we're getting ready for things to start opening again. And it is always a problem in the summer, you know, when you're not wearing your coat, especially if like Joe 
you like to, you know, flaunt it in your skinny jeans. Not having a big <laughs> wallet in your back pocket. Curve is all about simplifying your life and making your daily finances more affordable. And you can have your MasterCard, your Visas, all on one card and app, not to mention all of your loyalty cards as well. So if you're the same, you go somewhere like Boots or Tesco and they're like, you know, have you got your card with you? And I'm like, oh, I left it at home. That happens to me I, all the time. I'm a Curve user, actually, before we got this. And, you know, mm. God, I'm always losing my cards. <laughs> and this is a wicked app because basically what you can do is you can have everything on Apple Pay, Google Pay or Samsung. And that also means it's contactless. You don't have to take it with you. You can have it on your Fitbit or you can have it on your phone. But you can also have all your loyalty cards on there as well. And that's like, you know, game, CEX, you can have your Nectar card. I've had a Nectar card for years and I've never actually topped it up because I've never just had it there. It's been in the wrong wallet or it's been in a drawer somewhere. Yeah, and I think one of the things I love about this as well is not only does it mean, you know, your entire wallet is in one app, but you can keep track of your finances as well and what you're spending on different cards too. One amazing feature they've got is something called Go Back in Time. Yeah, so you can switch payments from one card to another up to 90 days after that happened, which is amazing. So, you know, you've charged something to the wrong card. You can actually go back and pick it. But also, it's got purchase protection. And if you're buying stuff on eBay, you're kind of buying retro consoles, then it's covered for like €100,000, which, (laughs) I don't know, you could have some really big devices there, couldn't you? Yeah, Joe's already eyeing up things you can buy on eBay. Well, I was thinking of a (laughs) Nintendo disk drive, which we're about to talk about in a minute. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I love as well, I mean, for guys like us that, you know, tech curious, you could say, I think, you know, the excitement of this, because, I mean, when when I was chatting to the guys from Curve, it does kind of make you feel like this is going to be the future, And this is like, you know, we're at the start of something now that's going to be everywhere in a few years' time. And, you know, being early adopters and getting in there at the start and being part of this is just really exciting, I think. Yeah, and also, like, this isn't a paid membership or anything like this. This is a, it's it's kind of like a gateway. And uh, the Curve Blue card has no monthly fees and it just boosts all your other cards. So you can actually get cash back on selected retailers as well. So if you're going out and you're buying stuff from like Amazon and eBay, you can even get cash back on. Yeah, and Uber, you know, places that you use all the time as well. So what we want you to do is we want you to give this a try. And actually, we want to give you some free money. Oh, mate, I wish I'd known about this deal before I'd actually signed up. (laughs) (laughs) So all you need to do is head on to this website right now, curve.com slash retro, and you will get five pounds after your first transaction. So there's no monthly fees. Uh, Sign up right now to the Curve Blue card, and we will give you five pounds after your first transaction. And of course, support the Retro Hour podcast by supporting our sponsors. Thanks to our good mates at Curve. Right then, lots of new stories to get through this week. Now, um, this story has been everywhere. Someone has opened a brand new Nintendo 64 DD dev kit. Yeah, this this was a lot more interesting than I thought it was going to be when I first saw this. I saw this a couple of days ago. And uh, this actually comes from a YouTuber who I follow called um, Rerez or Rez. I think it's Rerez, you say it. Uh, but Shane Lewis is the guy behind it. And I thought this was just, you know, which is, would have been interesting anyway, that he's got his hands on a sealed Nintendo disk drive. I was like, oh, cool. Yeah, he's got a sealed one. Like, that's that's awesome. But no, it's it's the development kit he's got his hands on. Um, so from what I understand, a private collector, a fan of his, sent him this to do an unboxing of it. And he's not done a video of it uh, or anything like that at the point of his recording. I'm sure there might be a video soon, but he's done a Twitter thread of him going through the unboxing. And this looks amazing. It looks so awesome just to kind of get that inside look of like, you know, the development kit of the DD drive. And it's interesting because it was actually Metal Jesus got one a couple of years ago as well, didn't he? I remember Metal Jesus's video and Metal Jesus was talking about like, oh, we've got the disc the actual discs here and you know these blue discs are incredibly rare and there's a big stack of like five of these and he's even got the the labels for them and yeah oh man. god it, it it's just in such good complete mint condition yeah yeah because didn't like metal juices he got it at like a garage sale in a bin or something like I, I, that. I think he finds all this kind of stuff in <laughs> seattle you know seattle yeah. seems to be just full of retro things exactly but yeah so shane's got you know, the sealed, he's got five of these blue discs, like you say, 
They've not even had the label stuck on them. The labels are still like in the original packaging. He's got all the Japanese instructions. But this, what's really interesting is he's got like, it comes with like a development N64 cartridge as well. Now, none of us speak Japanese. He doesn't speak Japanese. So he's not really said what they're for or anything like that. I'm assuming you need the cartridge, you know, for the development kit. Like, you, you know, I'm guessing when you plug it into the computer and stuff like that, the cartridge has something to do with it. But what's also interesting is it comes with these adapters, which plug into the top of the N64. Uh, one of them's labeled an N64 Joint-01, and then the other one is an NUS DCC00, which is really interesting because it's got two cartridge ports on it, so you can plug it into the top of the N64, and then you could have two cartridges into the top Maybe of the N64. Maybe it's like ones used for authentication with it. Yeah. And uh, then you can play like the backup code on it or... Uh, with the other car and kind of running them at the same time. I'd be well scared just to plug them in, just so oh, God you don't same. fry it all, you know. <laughs> exactly. And, he, you know, he's noted that there's like the switches here and stuff, you know, on, on, the, on the motherboard for it and stuff, you know, so you can flip between them, stuff like that. What I'm really interested to see, I mean, the guy's got like 300,000 followers, so I'm sure somebody who can speak Japanese will probably translate this. And then I'm sure it's probably going to end up in the hands, hands of somebody who's going to have a a proper crack at this and probably develop a homebrew game on it or something like that or stick doom on it or something but yeah man this this was ended up being a lot more interesting than i thought it was going to be and like dan said i've seen it been seeing it everywhere i can't go five minutes on instagram without seeing this at the moment you know what i love about it is though you look at these pictures and obviously i'll um i'll link up the article that's on kotaku in our show notes and that looks like it could have rolled off nintendo's factory production line mm. today yeah, absolutely. It is insane. The best example of this I've ever seen. I mean, it's an interesting product anyway, because um, it says here in the article, only nine games ever came out on the DD. Yeah, only ever came out in Japan. And I think it only sold, yeah. I say only, but I think it sold 500,000 units, which I know 500,000, you know, is a big number, but compared to, you know, how much games consoles, even back then, you know, in 99, were selling, that the numbers just didn't, you know, warrant it coming out in the UK or America. So they just never came across from Japan. And the DD drive is, I didn't, I'd never heard of it as a kid. It wasn't until we kind of, you know, started doing this that I heard of it about five years ago. And I didn't realize so many games like Animal Crossing and Dosh in the Giant were Japanese exclusive N64 DD games. That they then brought out on the GameCube a couple of years later, you know, in the UK and stuff like that. So it just goes to show how powerful it actually was. And I really like the look of it. I like the like you know the floppy disk look of the cartridges that get you know the discs that go in. They like they remind me of big plastic floppy disks essentially. I um, just love the two ports. I think like you maybe you could put two games together and create the ultimate game. <laughs> yeah. like, Conquers Golden Eye or something. <laughs> Conquers Golden Eye. <laughs> Switch on there or something. But yeah, man, really interesting. I'm hoping somebody translates this and we get a little bit more information about it. Um, He's uh, chucked a load of photos on archive.org and I'm trying to look through them, but they're so high quality as well. That's another mm. thing about these photos. He's obviously taken them with a really high grade camera. And oh, they just look beautiful. And trying to download that on your 56k connection, Ravi. Oh god, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, a lot of the DD. I've always, you know, since I heard about it. I mean, I don't remember hearing about it back in the day, but it is for some reason. It is one of these bits of hardware that, like you said, you know, only nine games came out in Japan. Why do I want it so bad, Joe? Uh, just, just, just to say you've got one, so it can just sit there, and you probably play it once and do a video on it, and then never play it again. But you can just say to people, "I've got, you know, I've got an N64 DD," you know, yeah, that, a smug feeling. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's interesting because when I went to Japan, I didn't see any anywhere, so it just goes to show how rare they are. And I went to loads of game shops from one DD to another. Yeah, well, we need to talk about this. I mean, obviously, we did mention that, you know, last week, just after we finished recording, that big news did land that Dominic Diamond had a major announcement. Now, of course, Dominic, I mean, a real legend, you know, anyone that grew up with gaming back in the early 90s in Britain used to watch Games Master. We did an entire episode about the history of the show with Dominic last summer, and now he's just announced that he's releasing a new book, which is called Games Master, The Oral History, that landed on Kickstarter at the end of last week and has absolutely smashed it. And rather than us just talking about it, we thought we'd welcome him back on the show because it's always amazing to talk to the legendary Dominic Diamond. Hello, Dominic. It is a pleasure to join you fine gentlemen again. Well, I mean, we had you on last summer. I mean, like, I know this last year has all kind of felt like, you know, 12 months worth of Groundhog Days back to back. But 
since then, I mean, you've been using your time um, during COVID very wisely, actually, because you've been working on a project that I've just seen everywhere. Everyone's been loving this. You're writing a book about Games yes. Master. Games Master, the oral history. Um, a remarkably apt title in many ways. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so yeah, that's we've, we've been beavering away on that the last few months and it's been a lot of fun and... I'm uh, I'm beyond thrilled with what we've managed to to produce. We, we've got in touch with so many people who worked on the show, and it's basically them and the celebrity guests giving their memories of uh, the entire run of the show. And then I come in there and basically steer the whole thing with my recollections and behind-the-scenes anecdotes, but also the story of a young man who uh, was catapulted into immense fame way too early uh, to be healthy at the age of 22 and how I kind of coped with, or rather didn't cope with the rest of that decade of not just being, you know, the head of a the kind of hottest new TV show, but also being made to be the face of this juggernaut industry and, and yeah, and what that was, what that was like. So, you know, laughter, tears, anecdotes, there will not be a dry hanky in the house. <laughs> well, I've, I've seen there's a lot of quotes from uh, celebrities here and you've got like Robbie Williams doing the foreword as well. That was the loveliest thing, I think, about the whole book. So we were talking, me and uh, Jack, the editor, and we were saying, like, who could we get to do the foreword? And we were trying to think, well, let's have a guest that was on the show. And we thought, well, who's a guest that was on the show is still really big today, but also represents 90s culture so much. And basically it was, it came down to Robbie or Zoe Ball. And <laughs> really, they were, the, they were the kind of two on the shortlist. So... Jack uh, had written to um, uh, Robbie's agent and then he'd said to me, he said, listen, I'll tell you what might help this. He said, Dominic, why don't you send an email uh, to Robbie via his agent? And I'm like, oh, I don't know if he wants to bother with the likes of me these days. So I did it anyway, what I thought was an amusing little note and it was the most surreal thing it was like i get up in the morning in, in the, the 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 frigid wastes of calgary north of the wall in canada and there's an email from someone called rob w and i'm like who's that and i click it and it's this fantastic email from robbie in los angeles uh not only with the foreword already written, just the greatest foreword I could have possibly dreamed of, full of enthusiasm and how much he's loved the joystick and it's you know it's been every house he's had since. And but also <laughs> this great <laughs> little thing about how are you doing? You know what was the nineties like? And you know I've left all that stuff behind me now. I just I'm, I'm wanting to start gardening. So then I replied, I'm like, oh Robbie, I love gardening these days. So there was about a week where I was swapping tips with Robbie and guiding him <laughs> on things like horse manure. So that was a lovely little <laughs> that was a lovely little bonus to happen as a result of the book. I'm looking forward to the Dominic Diamond and Robbie Williams gardening podcast. <laughs> <laughs> that would be brilliant. <laughs> And one thing that everybody seemed to be laughing about was uh, some of the pledges as well, yeah. especially the uh, Peacemaker pledge that you had. Yes. It's funny, that originally was, we had a little bit of a disagreement about the title uh, rather than the actual thing. I wanted to call it the happy finish because um, <laughs> I think it is, it would be such a wonderful quarter to the show. The plan is, is that if there is one person, I'm not really sure we'll get this one because it does cost £5,000, but it is the chance for like a true fan to genuinely uh, decide the coda, the epilogue of the show, which is uh, I will go down to Dave Perry's uh, tattoo studio with the uh, the buyer. I will apologize to Dave. I will I will mend that bridge and then to seal the deal, we, both of us, uh, myself and the buyer, will get tattoos from Dave himself. And then we'll we'll go to the pub. And actually, what I want to do as well, I can't remember if we put the writing in this. Um, if if you want to play a game, if you want to play a game on your phone, Dave and I will commentate on it in the pub, which will also replicate my audition for Games Master itself, basically, because I just like uh, was commentating on a little Game Boy Nintendo uh, football game. So yeah, so it's your chance to basically give the show the ending that we in our nice, cosy, much nicer people, reflective middle age selves. It's the kind of one that I think we all want. I love the fact that Dave contributes to the book as well. Um, and who else yeah. is in there? Because I imagine you needed quite a lot of help to kind of put together what happened in the 90s again. Yeah, we did. I was really pleased um, 
that Dave contributed because obviously he's um, he's not been shy about discussing that incident over the years. Let's face mm. it, but this is a genuinely reflective, different take from him, and and from me, and from all of us, from all the major players. I mean that that part of the book's about twenty pages on its own, and it, there's a lot more stuff going behind the scenes, and it also ties into bizarrely uh, the stuff that was happening with me and David Walliams and Matt Lucas on Night of Plenty, which was pretty much the same time. And so I don't think I handled that day terribly well myself. So it's um, it's and I say this in the book, and I'm not being up my own bum, but it is. Shakespearean tragedy with Dave as the Shakespearean tragic hero with the fatal flaw, with that one fatal flaw. And it's a, it's a cracking read. And the, um, what was interesting was, uh, as you'll know, having, you know, had me on your show, uh, nothing has changed with me over the years. I'm still basically set up line, knob gag, set up line, knob gag, set up line, knob gag. And I basically went to write the book like that. And what was great about having an editor like Jack Templeton was he would throw this stuff back at me and say, no, we've done that. We've heard all this stuff. I want you to actually go deep into the story and tell me the emotions and what it felt. And as a result, we've got we have got a book, and it's not something I'd say very often about me. We've got something of real depth here, <laughs> and it's a, it's a real deep dive story uh, from me and and you know basically pretty much every single person that either produced or directed or researched a whole lot of contestants, the bosses, uh, even the you know the commissioning editors from Channel Four. It's been an incredible achievement but getting all these people together and i'm extremely grateful that they and all did it read only memory of producing really good books oh, and oh yeah just seeing the reaction to this you know you've absolutely smashed the target so far we had yeah that was a there's obviously a little bit of trepidation i've never done a kickstarter before and it, c- it can be a very public humiliation um so it was two stages i mean i, I was i, I felt Read Only Memory knew what they were doing because they've done this so many times and their books are just lavish. They are such wonderful, glorious, posh coffee table books that can sit next to my Dermot, my Dermot Gavin and Terence Conran gardening books and everything. <laughs> and, um, and it's beautifully done. So I kind of felt he he was quite confident about it, but to launch it on that first day, and I was like, okay, well, maybe we'll get 25% of the funding on day one. I'll be happy with that. But to get half the funding, like within the first couple of hours, and then basically fund the whole thing on day one, which I'd, I'm not sure how many times that's happened on Kickstarter with a book anyway. So it was it was a, a wonderful sense of, of relief, first of all. But then there was also that different level, which was I had so many messages, which I'm still replying to uh, from people on, on social networking, just re- how glad they were that something like this was coming out and what it meant to them, the show. And also because, it, like you say, it's been a pretty rum, awful year for everyone. And they were just nice. Oh, there's something nice coming out of it. There's something <laughs> that's going to make us a little bit happy, uh, at, you know, during these during these times. You know, Games and Masters has been making the headlines in other ways recently. We keep seeing all these rumours about, you know, a, a new series coming along. Is that anything that you, you're aware of or you've been approached? I, I keep, I saw those headlines as well. Good yeah, answer. I mean, it's, I, I, I cannot, I, I cannot answer a question I've not been asked myself. So I know as, uh, as much, probably less than anyone else does. I know Channel Four are trying to bring it back, or they're trying. I know Channel Four are, are investigating relaunching a show called Games Master. I'm not entirely sure it's how much it is like the original show, but you know, I don't own the rights, um, so uh, no one spoke to me. Uh, about it they have i mean i'm I'm, they have it's difficult i've not commented a lot on it because i don't want to get into a big kind of dick swinging thing with channel four or future publishing because future gave us the rights to do the book and i'm very grateful um but uh, no nobody has spoken to me at all about that so i know nothing but i mean you know it's it's you know, it's not my show. I don't own the rights. I mean, they, they can do what they like. You know, people, I mean, they, 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 they've made a Games Master series without me before. And um, yeah, how, how did that work out? <laughs> well, Dom, you know, for any of us that love Games Master back in the day, this book just looks like a real love letter to the show. And uh, I'm sure it's going to be full of incredible stories. Games Master, the oral history um, running on Kickstarter. Now, any idea when the book's going to be ready to come out? 
Oh, I get so much trouble from the publisher when I say these things. <laughs> I, I think we're going to get out in November. Um, what's what's good about it is unlike some Kickstarters where you pledge and it's like about 10 years later uh, that the thing comes out, it, it's all written. I mean, I, I I finished the writing side of it in December. So it's all that literally is just the 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 um, the practical part of, of printing it in um I think it's Italy we're getting it done by some posh arty thing. So, uh, so yeah, we're, we're hoping for November. Can I just say one more thing that even though we have already, we've got the funding now, we are about to release uh, more slews of reward tiers. There were certain things that um, we had, like one was uh, I would write a limerick uh, about the buyer and the show, uh, write it in the book, marrying you and the show together forever. We only said 25 of those. They went within a couple of hours. So we're about to release 50 more of them and there'll be more experiential Dominic Diamond flavored rewards that you can still get if you were unhappy about missing them the, the when, when it was launched. And we need to make that trip to uh, Dave Perry's tattoo studio happen. Yes, surely. if someone's got <laughs> 5,000 pounds, let's do it. Let's do it. Fantastic, Don. Well, listen, thanks so much for coming on and talking to us about it. We look forward to reading it. Thanks for the support, Dan and Ravi. I really appreciate it, guys. Now, of course, last week on the show, we were talking about that rumour that Sony were apparently closing down the uh, the PSP, the PS Vita, and the uh, PS3 store, which has now been confirmed a bit earlier on this week. But there might be some good news for those of us who want to play classic PlayStation titles on your PS5, as there's a new patent out there, or patent, depending on where you're from, that hints at PlayStation 1 backwards compatibility coming to the PS5. I'm so glad you said that then, because I was like, how do you say it? Is it patent or patent? So I'm glad you did that. <laughs> yeah, this, this, bases. This, this is purely speculation. But yeah, pa- apparently the patent is out there. So what it says, this is what it says word for word. So this disclosure relates generally to a system and method of awarding trophies in previously released or sold video games without modifying the original game. More specifically, the present invention relates to defining, detecting and awarding a set of trophies for players of previously released games. And apparently it's referring to emulated games. And obviously the PS5 plays PS4 games. So it surely it can't be about PS4 games because they don't emulate PS4 games. It plays them from the hardware doesn't it well i'm going to show my noobness here what are trophies because like you know they're achievements they're achieve so they're, they're achievements. essentially achievements that you get when you're on something like the psn network yeah yeah so trophies are just you know do you know what an achievement is for xbox yeah 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 so a trophy is you know playstation's version of achievements um and they weren't around obviously on ps1 and ps2 so the speculation is obviously that they're going to be releasing ps1 ps2 ps3 games and they're going to go back and obviously put trophies into those games, you know, because ah, okay. everything that comes out now has achievements and trophies. Even the Switch has them, do you know what I mean? Like on games, but it has in game ones. But yeah. They're so patronizing as well, aren't they? Like, you know, you've pressed start on the game. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah. Five points. Kind but, of but it might be fun for completionists, you know, someone who's played a game Absolutely. to death or one of their favorite ones. And Absolutely. All these... It, it, Achievements have, trophies kind of, come out, achievements have kind of ruined games for me because of I end up achievement hunting after I've completed a game because I want to make the most of it. And because of that, I've gone to a really bad habit, or you could say a really good habit, of buying HD remasters and re-released games for PlayStation 4 and Xbox One because I want to get the achievements even though I've got the game sat upstairs on Sega Saturn. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, oh That's yeah. how they get you, Joe. That's how they get me. And, th- and if they do this, they're going to get me again because I'm going to end up buying all these PS1 and PS2 games I've got sat upstairs buying them for five ten pound and just sitting there achievement hunting trophy so, hunting so they're basically retroactively adding these achievements into it that's weird yeah. i mean it's not been confirmed but that's what the patent says so and it's interesting but it's you know i was moaning last week about how like you know the ps3 has so many ps1 games on the you know on the psn store which is now obviously you know being shut down for them um, and I was saying, oh, it's such a shame because there's all these games that you used to be able to buy and stuff that you could run on a PS3, and now we're not going to be able to get them. But I'm hoping it's because because of this, they're now actually just going to move it all to PS4 and PS5. They've got a huge back catalogue. They might as well take advantage yeah. of it. Exactly. Yeah, it does feel like an easy win for them. I mean, you know, why wouldn't they do that? Yeah, and I can't see, like, if they've already ported a lot of this stuff to PS3, I can't imagine it's going to be that difficult to just slap it on the PS4 and PS5 store. Yeah, I mean, when you look at, you know, the, the the Xbox, that can easily emulate 360, you know, even 360 titles, which, you know, were much more advanced than, like, you know, PlayStation 2 or PS1. Mm. Um, and the hardware is not much different between the PS5 and the Xbox X. So I'd imagine, you know, 
the in-house team at Sony could probably come up with something that's going to emulate all previous generations and then uh, sell them to you on the store all over again. Yeah, exactly. And I'm going to be the one sat here going, take my bloody money. <laughs> <laughs> I'll buy Crash Bandicoot for the 50th time. Yeah, exactly. Just to get some achievements. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, well, I still can't get hold of a PlayStation 5. I, I keep seeing everyone's got them. But every time I go online anyway, I still can't get older ones. Scalpers. I know. So, so many of my friends are posting that they've got them now. And I'm just like, well, I've got a baby. <laughs> achievement unlocked. That's my achievement. <laughs> well, this new service looks cool. Now, this is something that's going to be launching on Kickstarter um, in a couple of days' time, actually, when the show comes out. And this is a service called Pie Packer. Yeah, it looks quite interesting, uh, this Pie Packer. Basically, it's... It's a combination of things that we've seen before. So we've seen like AntStream that uh, is a gaming streaming service and they have quite a few titles on there as well. And we've also seen a reader. I can't remember, even though it was a couple of weeks, um, we, we had a system. We've seen that many of them, we forget them, don't we? <laughs> was it was it Plex or it was a kind of reader where you would read... Um, cartridges for game consoles yeah and it was retro arch wasn't it yeah and then retro arch that was it it yeah. was the n64 one they'd made yeah yeah so this is uh called pie packer and it's basically a streaming service you've got a lot of games on there but you've also got this pie reader now the cool thing about this pie reader is you know it enables you to play your games online legally as well so you're not downloading rums you're taking it directly off the device but also, it's got what we said about the RetroArch one. It's got different console modes. So I'd love to see which consoles are supported because um, it's got like the base unit and then a little cartridge adapter. So maybe you can use it for the different systems. Yeah, so I, I don't feel like they've released enough information about this yet. Maybe they will when the Kickstarter starts. But at the point of recording this, seven days, so it's going to be about two days after the show comes out. Um, but essentially, just to kind of simplify it, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, Ravi, is it essentially, it, it's a console that you plug into your computer, so you play it, because from the pictures, they're playing it on like a monitor. Yeah. And and then essentially you can play it online and it will have its own games online, you know. It's kind of, it's kind of like a ROM ripper. Yeah, but and you play like, it in browser, and you play it in browser, don't you? Yeah, but the but, difference with that is it's for multiple systems. So they're yeah. showing the NAS, the Mega Drive, the SNES, um, yeah. SNES, Game Boy as well, I think. But what's, what really gets me where I'm a little bit sceptical is it says in the trailer, if we've not got a game on, you know, online that you're after, no worries, just put your the cartridge in and then you can play online. I have no idea. Like, how, so if I'm going to put Mario Kart in for the SNES on mine and Jan's going to put Mario Kart on the SNES for his, how on earth does that play online? How do we play on? Like, that's mm. that's where it's getting me. I want to know more. I, I think the idea is that you kind of have that and it somehow unlocks it into a sharing mode where you can share it with your mates yeah. and play on this video screen. But y you're right. If they had, like, an adapter for, I don't know, the uh, Acorn mm. and then you had some games there <laughs> or, 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 or a really obscure system that, uh, you know, there's not databases on... They've probably picked ones which have complete databases. And then, yeah. like, because if you're putting in like an import version of something or some really odd, like ROM, I don't know if it would load it up. Maybe it links to it somehow. Yeah. You know, I was yeah. looking at it and I wondered if, because I mean, in, if you scroll down a bit, there's a picture of a laptop with um, what looks like a mini console with a, a Super Nintendo cartridge in there. Mm. So, what I wonder is whether it just kind of it does it on like a system level, depending on kind of, you know, what kind of systems they go up to i guess but if like you know you could for example just put something in the code that meant that for every super nintendo game it just does like a virtual second controller port over the network so then you know any any games that you play too the person on the other end is going to be able to play yeah potentially um there, there must be some you know they're, they're advertising that's what it's going to do so surely you know surely it will be the case and it looks like there's a few attractive things here so they've got like the uh magic link which is i don't know if you've used that it's basically one link that you can send to your friend and then boom straight away they're in it it's got yeah. video chatting and then it's got quite a few good titles uh they're showing sensible soccer at the moment descent to which was, gym to yeah yeah a worm's blast which is mm. the best but uh Micro Machines Racing. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a few. But they've got Xen Xeno Crisis as well and a few. Uh, w Worms World Party as well. So, you know, not not bad launching with these titles. 
Yeah, that's true. I mean, it, it's funny because I feel like I keep seeing Earthworm Jim 2 on all these like clone consoles and stuff like that. Um, but I'm interested to see how much it'll be uh, when the Kickstarter does go live and how it'll do. Um, but I do want to know more information about it. But yeah, you know, in the trailer, they're making it look like it's completely seamless, like playing online with your friends like retro games. You know, if they hit it off, then that's going to be really, really awesome. But until I see it, I'm sceptical. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the technology behind it. That's what we we nerds want to know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think it's cool, though, because, I mean, it, it's always been a case of, and I know a lot of old games get re-released on PSN or Xbox Live, but there are a lot of classic games where I always think, oh, it'd be great if I could play that online with, like, my brother, you know, who mm. lives 200 miles away, that kind of thing. Um, obviously, with this he's going to need like the, you know, if we're playing it on cartridge, he'll need a copy of the game on cartridge as well. I, I imagine. Maybe, I maybe imagine not. Like, maybe not. We don't, we don't know. We don't know, Dan. Maybe That's why I'm the owner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe the owner will put their copy of Cyborg Justice in and then everyone can come everybody and enjoy can it. Play it. it. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, That's it, it does true. say here, actually, play online with your friends. We only allow ROMs that are legally owned by users. So I guess, you know, when you have a game, you're only legally licensed to use it for yourself, I guess. Yeah, maybe. So, Which means maybe we both yeah. need it. Yeah, so um, so watch those eBay prices go. What what are the chances of finding someone else with a copy of, (laughs) you know, a really rare title and then go, right, we've got four of them. Should we play stadium events online? I don't know. Maybe maybe it'll apply. Yeah, it'll apply to the one call or something like one ROM per per four people or something. Who knows? We'll see. Yeah, but that is a good point, though, because, I mean, you know, if you are one of these guys that have got, like, you know, a really rare game, it would connect you to, like, the other four or five people in the world that have got it as well, and you probably can play it with them for the first time ever. So, you know, <laughs> that could be a really cool cool thing about this, I guess. So we'll keep an eye on that. It's called Pie Packer. Um, Kickstarter starts in a couple of days' time. Uh, we'll link that up in our show notes as well. Now, we're going to be chatting to um, Robin Habron from the amazing YouTube channel 8-Bit Show and & Tell, and, of course, been involved heavily in those Commodore 64 clone systems over the last decade or so as well he'll be on the show in just a moment before we do that uh, let's give a massive thank you to another sponsor this week this is our very good friends at jeff wayne's the war of the worlds the immersive experience now we did talk about this on last week's show we've had a few people get in touch saying how incredible this looks and i mean i remember when we first heard about this i sent the trailer over to joe and the first thing you said is look you know when lockdown's over and this opens again this summer we need to get down to london and check this out yeah, man, this looks insane. This, this, the only way I can describe it is I thought when we first kind of got like a couple of weeks ago, they sent this over to us. I, I had to watch the trailer to get my head around what it was because I just thought it was like the theatrical experience. Like you go see the War of the Worlds in theatre, but it is far from that. This is like a 5D immersive, like fully immersive adventure. That's the only way I can describe it. I just go watch the trailer because it's just like, it's just crazy. You're just going down slides and everything like that. And I personally love the War of the Worlds um, rock opera and you're doing it all to the soundtrack. So I, this, this just looks like mind blowing. And, you know, I can't even describe how cool it looks. Just like, it looks so immersive. You've got VR headsets for some of it. You know, there's seven, there's 17 characters in it, which features 12 live actors as well. And then there's a mix of holograms as well. And, uh, VR characters, which just like blows my mind. And there's some actually really big names involved in this as well. Yeah, so it, it actually features a cast of like 17 characters, and uh, that's 12 live actors plus a mix of holograms, projections, and VR. It's got the uh, West End star Carrie Hope Fletcher from Heathers, Les Miserables, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, Tom Brittany from Grandchester, Make Me Famous, and Anne Marie Wayne from The War of the Worlds Live. Yes, I mean, this is, it's something that's going to tickle all five of your senses as you crawl and slide and weave your way through 22,000 square feet of immersive action, 24 extraordinary scenes as well. And when you see that moment when the 300 foot Martian fighting machine suddenly appears and the evacuation of London. I mean, and this isn't like, you know, a, a half an hour thing. This is like a two hour a proper two hour show. experience as well. I don't know if I would yeah. laugh, cry or scream when I saw that. <laughs> like, probably all three. All, all three at once, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is London's favourite immersive night out and actually it reopens this summer from the 22nd of May until the 30th of October. And um, if you book, actually, obviously it's all completely COVID secure as well and uh, you can nip onto the website right now and, of course, you'll be helping out the show 
uh, with this COVID booking guarantee. So that means you can buy tickets with complete confidence and cancel any time up until 5 p.m. the day before your experience. So we want you to check this out. I mean, it is going to be the most incredible day, not only to get your friends and your family and you know really make a day of this and something you will not have checked out before. And we've got a great offer, which gives you £10 off all orders over £180, if there's a group of you together, and 5% off orders under £180 with the Retro Hours exclusive code. So all you need to do is nip onto this website right now, thewaroftheworldsimmersive.com, and simply enter the code RETRO at checkout. So that is thewaroftheworldsimmersive.com. Enter the code RETRO at checkout. Make that massive saving and help out the Retro Hour podcast with our very good friends from Jeff Wayne's The War of the Worlds, The Immersive Experience. And of course, I'll put those links in our show notes as well. Now, let's just take a quick moment to give a huge thank you to the lifeblood of this show, the people who keep it going week in, week out, allow us to bring you the Retro Hour every single Friday, bring in these amazing guests as well. And these are our incredible patrons how much do we love our patrons lads i oh, totally love them you know they they, they keep the show going and also they kind of keep the fun going like when when we have these patron meetups oh it's so good like just sitting there and watching people talk about their collections and the stuff that they've got mm. but also it's a great source of news so we can kind of share news stories and go oh have you heard about this have you heard about that and it's just creates the whole community feeling and vibe behind the podcast and we do um, a patrons exclusive podcast as well called the retro hour after hours no spoilers but we are going to be doing something a little bit different for um, the one that's hopefully going to be out this weekend aren't we yeah, I thought of this about two days ago. And I thought that would be really funny if we do that. So, yeah, man, hopefully that'll be out in the next couple of days. So uh, you can get access to the second podcast that we do by backing us on Patreon. You also get the regular podcast early. You get it ad-free and plenty more perks as well. Join us for the monthly hangouts. And we, we like to run things by our patrons as well and get feedback. So, you know, you guys are really part of what we do each week. And, of course, you will get a mention in the most exclusive high score table in the world of retro gaming, the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. Like this week, a big shout to Fred, Brian Seckold, Lee Mintram, Richard Yates, and Jade Barefoot, who all made donations into the running of the show. We really, really appreciate your support. And if you'd like to join them, all the details are at theretrohour.com. Right then, next we're going to talk about cloning the C64 and just really geeking out about Commodore Classics. A bit of Apple history in here as well. Just such a really good chat with our special guest, Robin Harbron from... 8-Bit Show and Tell is next on the Retro Hour podcast. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast and it's time to welcome on this week's very special guest. Now, um, I'm really excited about this week's interview as we're going to be talking about a lot of my favourite machines. Um, You know, in particular, the VIC-20, the Commodore 64 as well. All these machines that I grew up with and I absolutely love back in the day with. Our guest this week, Robin Habron from the 8-Bit Show and Tell. How are you, Robin? I'm good, thank you very much. Great to have you joining us. Now, um, before we get into kind of talking about your great YouTube channel that's been going a couple of years now and, um, you know, it's getting really popular at the moment, it's always kind of interesting just to find out, you know, your geek credentials. Where did it kind of begin for you then? What was kind of your earliest memory of computers? Yeah, just seeing the arcades. I was born uh, same year as Pong, 1972, mm-hmm. and the uh, arcades were just just coming into being when I was you know, uh, what, seven, eight years old, late seventies and seeing the early arcade games. And then the Atari 2600 shows up and, uh, the early pet computer, uh, seeing at school. So just when I was six, seven, eight years old, that's when video games, computers were starting to show up everywhere. I was fascinated originally just to play the games, but then as soon as I learned about programming, uh, I just started getting, you know, on the pet computer at school. Uh, I started learning to program as soon as I could. And eventually, uh, I didn't actually get my own computer until the early 80s. But all, all that time, just where, wherever I saw a video game and then uh, computers, I, I was just totally interested in it. Were um, having pets at school kind of a a bit of a standard thing in Canada? And were there any other educational machines? The pet was the first one to show up. There would just be uh, one per classroom. Gradually, 
Uh, and then later the Commodore 64s were in our classes. So the pet was, I think, just kind of a school by school thing. The, the first one we even saw was actually a classmate whose dad brought it into the classroom and there it sat at the back of the room that day. And that was amazing. Uh, and I thought, wow, imagine having a dad that has a pet that, you know, uh, <laughs> would, would bring it to, to school. And then, yeah, the, the Commerce 64s became very common. So in my part, I'm in Thunder Bay, Ontario, Canada, and pretty much Ontario wide, there were Commodore computers in most classrooms. So what was the first computer you got yourself? I actually got a Timex Sinclair 1000, which was the North American version of the ZX81. I, I only got it because it was cheap. My dad, uh, I said, dad, I got to buy a computer. I'd saved up enough money. We went to the bookstore and didn't buy a book, but looked at the book in the store. It was like, uh, you know, buy your first computer. And he flipped through it until he found the cheapest computer in there. It was $99. So that was the one, <laughs> no other qualifications, just what was the cheapest one? And we went and bought it. Uh, well, you compared that to the price of like an Apple II or something. I mean, that was way cheaper. Oh yeah, it was. that was incredible. And, uh, but I had so many problems with that low computer game to save and load from the cassette uh, deck. And anyway, we, we ended up returning it, breaking my heart. But um, then about a year later, I managed to get a Commodore 64 because the price of those had come down so much, uh, down to, I think, 199 or 229 And that was amazing. Of course, I was so much happier with a C64. What was the uh, gaming scene like in Canada? Were there many like gaming de developers and was there like a bit of a kind of bedroom industry going on? There was, but it was fairly small. A uh, couple of the most famous Canadian games would be uh, Frantic Freddy, uh, BC's Quest for Tires. Um, later, uh, we got into uh, EA Games. Oh, why can't I remember the name? Um, uh, like Test Drive and all that w were made out west in Canada and around the Vancouver area. Uh, Accolade Games. A lot of that was was made out west, but in those early bedroom coder days, there actually wasn't all that much activity going on in Canada. I've I've been trying to research that to make an episode about that, and I'm, <laughs> it's taking a long time to to get many of the games. There there really weren't that many in the early '80s, but then of course game development really started taking off later. So were those the kind of dream machines that you really wanted as a kid? Uh, I definitely wanted, yeah, an Atari 2600, ColecoVision, Intellivision, Vectrex. And uh, later in the 90s, I actually picked up all those myself. That's uh, how I got into collecting <laughs> was because all that stuff that I wanted so much when I was a kid uh, became available uh, cheaply, inexpensively used uh, in the 90s. But, but. Uh, that, that all to say that when I finally did get a computer, I was totally happy with that. Uh, that uh, and I'm also glad that that led me into programming. Have you um, still got quite a big collection then? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've got, I'm down here in my basement surrounded by all the, I've got dozens and dozens of systems, consoles, uh, computers. I've got pretty much every machine Commodore ever made, a fair number of Atari uh, and then all the consoles up into, uh, I don't have all the most recent ones, but I've probably got three quarters or 80% of all the consoles that uh, were for sale in North America. So I yeah. bet you, you're glad you got them when they were cheap. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> I, they, uh, just one, one example. I have two Vectrex systems. I assume you're familiar with them. Oh, uh, our last there. episode was a, a Vectrex one. So yeah. Oh, was it? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so one of them I bought for $35, and that included with about eight games. Uh, but one I got for $5 at a thrift shop. Uh, it had the power cord cut off, but I just put a new power mm. cord on, and it's perfect. So I have <laughs> I have two Vectrex for a total of $40. Well, you mentioned the Commodore 64, and I mean, from 
the, the people I knew as a kid, you know, had Commodore 64s. I had the plus four, unfortunately, which um, wasn't up to quite the same standard as a 64. But I had lots of friends that had the 64, and that was kind of, in our group, like the, the ultimate machine. It was like, you know, the dream computer. Why, why was that such a special machine for you? Yeah, I, th I think when I first went to go and buy the C64, I had actually intended to get a VIC-20, and uh, we drove down to Duluth, Minnesota. I'm in Canada, but... Uh, Minnesota is only, well, the border is only about 30 miles away. Anyway, we, we went down there because the prices are cheaper and that's a family vacation. And yeah, I intended to buy a VIC-20, but my parents said, hey, this computer is newer and look, it's only a little bit more money. So I'm so glad that they suggested that. And I bought that because of how vastly better the 64 was than the VIC-20. I like the VIC-20 as well, but you just can't compare, you know, <laughs> the, the abilities. And so that 64, I really think that that was the, the computer that was able to do enough, well enough that you would get years and years of fun out of it. Previous computers like the VIC-20 or the, the ZX81, they were so limited that they just couldn't play all the different genres of games that were coming. But the C64 was just good enough with the sprites and the scrolling and the excellent sound chip that it could keep up with the NES. And even into the 16-bit era, the C64 could at least approximate all those future kind of games, the game genres that were coming, like uh, the side-scrolling platformer that became ubiquitous through the 8 and 16-bit console era, the C64 was able to do that well enough that it kept up for a long time into the 90s. So I think that's part of the magic of the 64. It was, uh, it was ahead of its time and became so affordable quickly that it, it was just kind of the perfect uh, platform to learn how to program on and to game on in that era. Were you um, ever into bulletin boards? Did you ever get on, onto the BBS scene? Oh, yeah. Uh, I bought a 300 baud modem used in probably 1985. And wow. uh, here in my city, we have a locally owned telco, uh, actually, that I worked for for 15 years before I started getting into game development and so on. Uh, but back when I was a kid, you could get your own phone line. I think it was about $8 a month or something. And I could have my own dedicated phone line with unlimited, not long distance, but unlimited local use. And that was huge. So, yeah, I, I was, well, I don't know if I was, you know, maybe 10, 12 years old, had my own phone line. I could BBS all I wanted. And, uh, yeah, there was a really great scene uh, in North America and even in my city because of how accessible the phone system was. What memories have you got then of, of that era online? Oh, uh, just sending my first messages to strangers. You know, you, you talk to the sysop and the sysop would come online and you're chatting real-time text with them. It just seemed amazing. And you would you look at sysops like, are you some sort of god or something? You know, you, this is your system and I'm calling into it. Uh, yeah. so that, that was amazing. And then downloading, oh, and I made a little game and I uploaded it to BBS and then, uh, maybe I'm just guessing if that was 86, 87, um, uploading a game from that I coded and other people downloading it and getting a bit of feedback about it. Uh, little did I know, you know, that was the future when I became like an iPhone game developer, uh, what, how, 30 years later, I, I'm, whatever the math is, you know, that was you know, the future, weird. right? Here, here I am making a game and electronically distributing it uh, to other people and getting feedback. And that, that was the future, but that was, that was like 86 or whatever. And uh, did you call it SysOp or SysOp? Was that like a battle between oh, how to pronounce it? Yeah, I always <laughs> said SysOp. I thought SysOp, the first time I heard somebody say SysOp, I thought, what a crazy pronunciation, but it's interesting how we have all these different words that you never said out loud to other people, right? If we, mm. In our electronic scene, you would see it in print and you would, maybe would say it to your group of friends at school. 
And then you would later find out, uh, yeah, do you say 1541 or 1541? Do you say SIS 64738 or 647? Yeah, all those different combinations of numbers and names um, within these geek subcultures like the Commerce 64. I, that comes up on YouTube. Uh, you know, I'm I'm Canadian. I have my own accent and I have my own dialect and people all around the world are watching my videos and I do get these people trying to correct me. Do I, I say composite or composite <laughs> video uh, and so on. It just goes on, you know, aluminum. And I actually lived in Australia for in 1987. So I picked up a bit of that PAL and Australian culture. That's how I found out more about the UK scene as well, because they would import a uh, zap magazine, yeah, zap yeah. 64. Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm going all over the place here, but <laughs> yeah, but, but yeah, how we pronounce those words is its own fascinating part of the culture. Yeah. My school, we used to say, um, Sega instead of Sega, you oh, know, until sort yes. of the hedgehog came around. Yeah. Which I think they still do in Australia and still call it Sega. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard that. <laughs> have you always been into like what we consider retro today or did you have like a, a break period and then rediscover some machines or, or think right that period's just like a golden age that i really want to get into yeah i've i've kind of always been into it like like i was saying in the 90s uh i started seeing atari 2600s go up for sale or even being given away so i would i would Nobody else wanted it in my city, but I would just grab it. I, yes. <laughs> and so I've never really gotten away from it. I think there's probably, probably not a year has gone by where I haven't programmed my Commodore 64 for some project um, or fired up one of my old consoles. Uh, yeah, I, I'd say I've just always been into it. I've always been learning, uh, collecting books and magazines and, and when i get asked uh you know I, when i do these deep dives on my youtube videos people ask where did you learn this or how how do you know this and it's just that i've always been buying books and magazines old ones and reading them and then experimenting so i guess i've just always be interested in learning well you mentioned a bit about your collection earlier What's it like then? What, have you got any like favorite machines in your collection and any holy grails that you want to add to it? I would love a C64GS, the game system yeah. that you had there in the UK for a short time. Uh, yeah, that's probably my Commodore holy grail. Uh, I briefly had a Commodore 65 here, amazingly, that I bought for about $100, uh, but wow. it didn't work. And then I turned around and sold it for about $2,000 in the 2000s. <laughs> and you know now, they're, I don't know what they're going for now. I saw one go for 20000 Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's kind of unattainable. But of course, there's this remake of it coming along. Uh, yeah, things I'm proud of, like, uh, oh, I've, I've got uh, a dual FD2000 disk drive now. You might not even know what a normal uh, a CMD was an American Commodore hardware manufacturer. They made mm -hmm. the super CPU and they also made a high density floppy drive called the FD 2000. Uh, they made three prototype uh, dual drives and I managed to get one of those. So that's a very rare thing. Um, Is that for the pet? Uh, it's actually for the Commerce 64. Right, okay. Yeah, and oh, and of course I've got two different prototype C64 DTVs, and that's because I worked, like Jerry Ellsworth made the C64 DTV, and I was uh, the lead programmer on that project. And so I had to, uh, you know, I've got the prototypes left over from when I was doing the software on that. Talking of the uh, C64 DTV, it was a uh, director TV, that was released in 2004, and this was like ages before any of these kind of recreations were even successful or, or, or mainstream. Like, how did you end up getting involved with that? Yeah, that was really neat. I, I, um, I met Jerry Ellsworth, I guess, back in the, was it the 90s or 
Yeah, yeah, it was in the 90s. She showed up at uh, one of our computer shows down in Chicago. I travel down there uh, every year. Uh, well, until last year was the first year in 20, <laughs> whatever it is. I think I made 24 years in a row I made it to Chicago for a Commodore meetup. Anyway, Jerry showed up there once and she had this, it, it, it was kind of incredible. We we thought it was like a joke almost because you know how we're, our hobby, especially in the 90s, was 100% male. It was just dudes, uh, really nerdy dudes. And Jerry shows up with... Um, this wire wrapped thing. And she says she's making a C64, uh, a new one, her, her own creation with VGA output and all this. And we're looking around for the hidden cameras. Uh, we figure it's a joke, but of course, Jerry's totally legitimate. It was our own biases <laughs> that made us, uh, think it wasn't real. Anyway, we, we became friends and, uh, a, a group of us and, some years later, I knew Jerry was working on her C64 still, but I didn't know it was getting commercialized. It was getting turned into this DTV. I had made a C64 game called Frogs and Flies, which got published on Lodestar magazine. Uh, and I also entered a couple of these game contests where you make a, a small game, just an online compo, and I, I won um, a few years in a row. So on Lemon 64 in 2004, maybe 2003, 2004, a Mark Greenshields posts that he's looking to hire a Commodore programmer. I don't know if you know Mark Greenshields. So at the time he was running a game development studio in Montreal, Canada, and was looking for a Canadian Commodore 64 programmer. I thought this was a joke, but it was on Lemon. I, I wrote him back and eventually I heard back uh, and they wanted to hire, and I had enough experience because of these games I had worked on that they took kind of a gamble on me. I got hired for this project, and it wasn't until the interview I said, so what is, the, like, you're making a C64? I said, uh, is Jerry Ellsworth involved? And the interviewer stops and says, how do you know that? And they were like, <laughs> they're all upset because I guess it was all like NDAs and like confidential stuff and, and yeah it was it, <laughs> i said well jerry's been a friend of mine for years and i figured i don't know anybody else who's making a c64 reproduction um it was, so anyway yeah that's how i it got was hired amazing that you kind of say that it, it it felt like a joke because it just takes me back to that time <laughs> when she did turn up with it yeah nobody thought it was real oh yeah they were like somebody's made a c64 on a chip <laughs> this is insane <laughs> yeah yeah, we, we we were the original, I guess, that group there in person looking at her very first prototype. And I guess we were the first p people to think, what a, you know, what kind of crazy joke is this? But no, she's, you know, 100% real. She flew up here to Thunder Bay uh, and we worked on it. She stayed at a hotel here and every day uh, I'd pick her up. We worked down here in my basement and, you know, she's amazing. And, uh, we had a lot of fun and got that project done and, uh, you know, it was well received and we're, we're all very proud of our work on it. You know, actually speaking about how well received it was, I do remember reading that QVC, which, you know, interesting bit of trivia, QVC's HQ is actually Commodore International's old HQ yes. in Westchester, which I thought was a <laughs> nice bit of, bit of poetry there. <laughs> yeah. And they bought um, a quarter of a million units and sold 70,000 of them on the first day. I mean... That must have blown you away, did it, how successful it was? Yeah, it, it was incredible. And uh, and then it immediately led into the second revision, which uh, they signed a contract with Radio Shack to make a Hummer DTV, This uh, the Hummer vehicle. <laughs> Hummer is a funny word. Anyway, uh, the uh, about truck racing, and it was going to use the same DTV chip. So we got hired back as the software developers for that project. And that was pretty incredible too. I don't think it was as, as successful, but to be able to go into a Radio Shack store and see a thing I worked on up on the Radio Shack, you know, on the shelf there was, was pretty incredible. And the uh, DTV, like, it wasn't just a small little kind of cheap device or, or recreation or bad emulation. It was like a really 
well done version of the C64. Like what hidden features and kind of Easter eggs did you guys put inside there? Yeah, on on the hardware level, uh, Jerry went to great lengths to expose uh, several of the signals from the DTV, the the ASIC, the the chip that drive the single chip. Uh, so that you could, you know, solder a disk drive uh, connector on there, and a joystick connector, and a keyboard, and none of that was necessary to the actual product. And she had to do all kinds of um, disguised things uh, so that the circuit board would still have those connections on it when it went for mass production. The the engineers in China would try to optimize those out, rightly so, actually. <laughs> They'd say, this isn't necessary. Why do you have this trace here? And why do you have this? Anyway, she, she did her best to uh, keep all that on the board. And then over on the software side, we just went all out cramming as many software features in there as we could. Uh, my friend Magervalp did a virtual keyboard uh, so that you could use the uh, joystick to type in basic. It was tedious, but it worked. Uh, I had some of my own little games on there. When you turn on a C64 DTV, if you waggle the joystick left and right during the boot sequence, it actually drops you into basic uh, or into a menu, and then you can go into basic. So there's a whole bunch of software uh, Easter eggs in there. David Murray, the 8-bit guy, before he started his channel, was actually one of the premier hacking uh, experts on the DTV. And he made a video uh, all about this that um, you can still find it online if you dig for it. There's just so many secrets in it. And it was It was just lots of fun. Well, talking of hacks, I remember seeing a lot of hacks made by the public, like like you mentioned with David. Um, mm-hmm. What were some of the best ones that you saw? Oh, a couple of those little laptop ones were just amazing to to see it all in a tiny little uh, eight inch. I, I don't know about the size of like a DVD uh, portable DVD player uh, with a working keyboard and joystick ports. Uh, there were a couple guys who made amazing ones but I, I just thought those were so cool oh and, I, and yeah and it just reminded me david uh like the 8-bit guy he was working on a shuttlecraft like a star trek scale shutter shuttlecraft in his backyard and at one point he was using a c64 dtv to drive the lights inside wow. the inside it <laughs> really funny do you think like these early projects really help lay the foundation for the kind of cause of FPGA uh, design and, uh, you know, this kind of whole Commodore clones that we're getting nowadays. Yeah, I think it it certainly raised the awareness and established that people are interested in this, uh, that as nice as emulators for Windows or whatever are, uh, people like having a more uh, hardware-oriented solution and I think Jerry's work totally laid the groundwork for where we are today. If if not the technical side of it, just the awareness uh, and that she did such a good job so early. It's, it's amazing what she was able to do uh, back then. Well, you started your YouTube channel in 2019. What inspired you to start your own channel then? Part of it was uh, David Murray. Uh, I've been friends with him since uh, since the C64 DTV. He contacted me, and I met him in person in Chicago once. Um, and, uh, yeah, we've been friends ever since. He'd call me up sometimes. He even invited me on his show a few times. Well, actually, several times. So if you watch enough old 8-Bit Guy episodes, I will actually appear on camera a few times in there. Yeah, and sometimes David would even uh, call me up. He, you know, he's he's becoming a, a very good game developer, retro game developer in his own right. Uh, but along yeah. the way, he would ask me questions, and I would have these conversations with him. And it it amazed me when he started selling his games, and he had that audience. Like he had built an audience through hard work on his uh, with his videos. But then he was able to 
pivot that into selling his own retro games to a, a you know a, a captive or, or receptive audience. And I thought that is so cool how he's got that following that he's built. And then I thought, well, you know, I I'd, I'd like to have that not not for my pride, but for my future <laughs> projects. I I've been imagining since I was. Well, in my 20s, I wanted to be a Commodore game developer or I wanted to be, and that I have done professional game development. The The DTV and the Hummer led to me working on a Game Boy Advance game and then Nintendo DS game or several, and then iPhone development. And that's been fun and rewarding, but all along I've, I've loved doing C64 development. And it amazed me that David has an audience like that. And I thought, well, maybe I can get an audience as well. Now, of course, I, <laughs> I you know, it's taken me two years to get 32,000 subscribers and David's got over a million, but I'm still happy with where the channel's at currently. And, um, and I like the opportunities it affords. I mean, it's taken me 12 years to get 60,000, so you're doing good. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that, that does prove that because a lot of people are like, oh, it's too late to start a YouTube channel now and get a following. But I think, you know, that, that proves that there is an audience out there if, if you've got the passion for it and you put the commitment in. Yeah, yeah, I, I certainly think so. You just have to have your own. Yeah, I, I felt like I could make videos that nobody else is making, not, not just David, I've got my own take on things and uh, the deep dives I do into programming, into retro computer books, into uh, looking more at the software side of things that while so many channels are focused on hardware and then, and, and bring my collection into it and my experience as a game developer. Uh, I guess I just thought, well, maybe I have something to something unique to contribute as well, but of course, I, it's all we're all standing on each other's sh like shoulders here. Where you know David and LGR and a couple of the other guys uh, by achieving like you know again a million subscribers <laughs> for this this hobby, that's amazing, and it, it makes it clear that that more of us can actually get into this area and uh, contribute. Well, you cover some really interesting things on your channel. I was watching a video that you did from the uh, Vintage Computer Festival, and that looked like a really interesting show. I mean, oh, yeah. what are the shows like that you've attended then over the years in in your local areas and, and in the US? Yeah, yeah, I, I love that. My, the main shows I go to, uh, you know, pre-pandemic, uh, World of Commodore in Toronto, Ontario. And then I drive down to the uh, Midwest Gaming Classic in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and the Vintage Computer Festival Midwest in around the Chicago area, Illinois. And so those are the three shows that I regularly attend uh, when I can. And they're, they're amazing. Now, I started going to these in the 90s when maybe 40 or 50 people would show up, which is fine. It's just that we were, we thought that was normal, you know, just have these small crowds. But over the years, like the, the Vintage Computer Festival has grown where you get many, many hundreds, if not a, like a thousand out to it. And then the Midwest Gaming Classic is several thousand, but that's a more mainstream. Well, it, it, it's got pinball, but it's also got classic arcades, consoles. Uh, it's not such a computer focus. It's more gaming, but it's still amazing that it's still steeped in the retro and is such a, a, a mainstream to, to think that thousands of people are interested, especially given when it was us in like a, an old uh, drafty church basement with like 40 people there, not that many years ago. It, it's amazing. The, the change that's happened. Well, on your channel, you've started covering the uh, Apple Lisa and you know, um, that system, we hardly see any of it in the UK. Do you think it needs more coverage online? Oh yeah, it's it's very rare, um, even here. And I normally wouldn't even get into sixteen thirty two bit stuff like that. And Apple's okay, but you know, it's I'd rather talk about Commodore. But I just had the opportunity to have that machine um, because of a local collector, so I, I went for it. You know, 
uh, I got to take it apart partly <laughs> and uh, just look at the construction of it. It's really quite revolutionary. The fact that it had the multitasking mouse, like a GUI operating system in 84 when uh, I know there was the Xerox machine and so on, but nobody had packaged that up into a machine that you could just grab, you could buy $10,000, but you could just go buy it and you would have the future basically. It's uh, a very uh, beautiful machine as well. Oh yeah. It? The yeah. way it's designed. Yeah. No, it, it was uh, really, that machine was the future. Basically it does almost everything our modern computers do. And it was doing it in 1984, uh, not perfectly, but, it was such an image of what the future of computing would be. I always think as well, you know, when you find machines that are a little bit kind of obscure from, you know, big companies like Apple, it is always interesting to see those products that didn't quite make it to mass appeal. Like I've watched videos on YouTube about like the Apple 3 that, you know, you, you hardly ever, ever hear anything about, but I, I find that kind of stuff interesting. I don't know whether you're the same. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, the Apple 3. I've seen several of them at the Vintage Computer Festival here. I've never uh, owned one, but yeah, th those failed machines nowadays are are very interesting because they have uh, unexplored. You know, people. <laughs> some of these machines would do new things, and most people didn't get to experience it. So it's interesting now to look back and see what was good and bad about those. Well, a machine that was obviously a big success that you cover on your channel, um, and we touched on before, the Commodore VIC-20. I mean, you've done quite a few videos on the VIC-20. What's kind of the appeal of that machine for you then? And is there much, much of a scene around the VIC-20 today? Yeah, the, the VIC-20 uh, has a devoted following. Uh, I like how simple it is. It's uh, those great big friendly letters, you know, it only has 22 characters across the screen instead of a more normal 32 or 40 and programming it is, is fun. Uh, it's got an appeal only having three and a half K of space. If you try and make a little game for it, it, it has that nice, uh, limiting <laughs> it's, it's, it's a nice mix of limits and abilities and uh, yeah, a friend of mine, Jeff Daniels, he's down in Chicago. He makes amazing little basic games for it. He runs a website called Denial, which is focused on the VIC-20. Yeah, he, he's a real inspiration because he makes these incredible little games that uh, if, if you play one of them, you'll just think, this is amazing that he crammed this in. It's just basic and it runs on an unexpanded VIC, but it's fun. And I always think as well, oh, I mean, sorry. it's similar to... The, the plus four as well, you know, the fact that it didn't have hardware sprites or it didn't yeah. have like a dedicated sound chip. I, I almost think in many ways, getting a playable game on something like the plus four or the VIC-20 is a bit more of an achievement than doing it on a 64, for example. Yeah, yeah. It, the the plus four is is so strange that <laughs> it, how it's slightly better than the 64 in a couple areas and a whole lot worse in others. So the plus four doesn't have quite the same charm to me because it feels too much like a spectrum. Uh, sorry to anybody who, who loves the spectrum, <laughs> but it it's um, without, without the sound chip, without the hardware sprites. Yeah. It, it's, it's still okay. It's, it's a neat machine, but the Vic 20 has those extra limitations. And uh, one thing about those huge characters that the Vic 20 has, it's almost like they're sprites because even though, you know, they're, they're only eight pixels square, but they're so big on the VIC-20 that it feels like you're moving a whole sprite around just by printing a character. Well, one thing about the Plus 4 that it definitely had over the 64 was um, the basic that oh, was built yeah. into the Plus 4, which, you know, many more commands, much more um, user-friendly, I think. The Commodore 64 basic always seemed quite limited compared to other machines that were around at the time. I mean, from memory, it was all, you know, peaking and poking. I know you cover Commodore 64 Basic a lot on your channel. <laughs> yeah. Have you got a soft spot for it there? <laughs> I certainly do, yeah. It's, yeah, it, it's totally terrible in the sense of uh, it's just the same Basic that was in the PET from back in 1977, the same Basic that was in the VIC-20, 
And due to the incredible time constraints they had when going from the VIC-20 to the Commodore 64, they, they did that huge evolution in really just a year, uh, in a way under, yeah, about a year, that they started with the VIC-20 and then just kept adding to it, essentially, you know, even using the same case uh, between the VIC-20 and the C64. And one thing they never found the time for was to improve the basic. Uh, they kind of addressed that with a series of add-on cartridges like Simon's Basic made there in the UK uh, and another one called Super Expander 64. But it wasn't until the Plus 4 and then the Commodore 128 where they uh, finally got around to improving the basic. Well, you also worked on a hugely successful project, which was the uh, C64 Mini, and you worked with the Mini and the Maxi. Uh, yeah. How, how did you get involved with that? It was uh, some of the same behind-the-scenes people that worked on the C64 DTV, uh, Darren Melbourne in particular. Uh, he's in the UK, I believe. Um, yeah, they contacted me when they got the C64 Mini because of my DTV work and just asked if I was available. And yeah, so it was that was really fun to work on. I specifically just worked on the C64 side where they had this library of games that they had the rights to, but there were various problems in implementing them on the 60 on the C64 Mini because it didn't have a keyboard. Uh, you know, it did have a virtual keyboard, but that's a pain to use. So I would just do things like uh, remove, basically I hacked those games that are in the C64 DTV. I modified them uh, just to make them play better on the that system without a keyboard, such as uh, eliminating certain key presses, mapping them to other joystick buttons, uh, removing some text and so on. Were you also amazed with the success of that one? Because, you know, you can actually go in the shops and see the C64 Mini as well there. Oh, yeah, that that was fantastic. When I was waiting for it to come here to Canada and uh, even our local, or not our local, our, our large chain uh, pharmacy drug store, we call it here Shoppers Drug Mart, uh, they brought in the C64 Mini and... This is when it was brand new, full price. And my, my dad, because he's a senior, he gets a, uh, a discount every Thursday. <laughs> so, so my dad and I, uh, yeah, me and my dad went around town uh, until we found a Shoppers Drug Mart with a, a mini and he bought it for me with his uh, 20% discount. And uh, nice. yeah, it, and it was a real fun thing. My, my dad really got into it because, you know, he knew I had worked on it. And uh, just kind of the thrill of the hunt and uh, getting a, you know, a senior citizen loves getting a deal. Uh, and it was a lot of fun. Well, yeah, I mean, you kind of touched on before, you know, the um, the Mega 65, which is the one I'm most excited mm -hmm. about at the moment. I mean, yeah, that goes way beyond the Commodore oh, yeah. 64 clone. I should have mentioned that. Uh, yes, yeah. Well, tell, tell us a bit about that. I mean, there might be people listening who are not familiar with what the Commodore 65 is and why this is a big deal. Yeah, the Commodore 65, the original one, was uh, Commodore in the US decided to make one last 8-bit computer, but they started at like 89, 90. I'm, I'm not sure of the exact timeline, but basically uh, Fred Bowen and some other Commodore engineers were working on this 8-bit Commodore way later than they should have. I mean, it was it was like five years too late, right? But it was a pretty amazing machine because it was an all-in-one Commodore 64 with a new C65 mode with a built-in three-and-a-half-inch floppy like an Amiga 500. And it had all yeah. these amazing new graphics modes. Uh, I think it had dual SID and it had a new VIC-3 chip in it that could do all kinds of new resolutions. So it was kind of like a dream 8-bit machine, like everything the Commodore 128 could have been, this was going to be it. And they actually got to the point where they had made a, probably a couple hundred prototype systems, and then Commodore went bankrupt, and the pro, or the program got shut down, then Commodore went bankrupt. Anyway, it, it's kind of like the ultimate 8-bit computer, and it, I guess it would have been the final ever 8-bit 
computer, certainly from Commodore, but maybe in the maybe in the whole world. There's been a, a, lo- a long-term project underway. I believe it's an Australian who's heading it up uh, to recreate the 65, the C65, called the Mega 65. And it's a pretty incredible project. Uh, it's going to be, or it is expensive because making small quantities of custom computers is expensive. Uh, but it is a really neat project. Um, I've, I've seen you've done a few videos about the super CPU, and I remember when that came out. That was like a awesome add-on. Do you uh, think you'd ever see a modern version of it? And uh, what makes it like one of your favorite add-ons? Oh, yeah, it's it's incredible. When the C65, I heard the C65 was happening, and then just through the magazines uh, that were still going in the early 90s, and then it disappeared. And I was pretty disappointed. But then CMD, uh, this American company, hardware manufactured, announced they're doing this Commodore upgrade, CPU upgrade, uh, which would put a 16-bit 65816 CPU as a plug-in cartridge for the Commodore 64. So I got on the waiting list and I paid my deposit and I got one of the very first ones when it arrived in 1996. Just the idea fascinated me to still be programming the VIC and the SID. It's a Commodore 64, but with way more RAM and a faster CPU, but everything else was still the same. And I liked that concept. And it was an amazing hardware achievement at the time that those engineers pulled it off so well. And it hasn't been recreated yet because (laughs) it's like almost like the engineering, you know, how like the Apollo, we can't go back to the moon because all the technology got lost or whatever. Uh, It's kind of, it's kind of the same thing. Like we can't (laughs) recreate the super CPU (laughs) exactly because the technology is being, and the knowledge has been lost. So uh, Jim brain is a friend of mine. He's an American who's working uh, on recreating that. The first step is basically to recreate the REU, the RAM expansion unit, which uses some of the same uh, DMA techniques to read and write, like to interface with the, the C64. And once he gets that done, he, he does want to recreate the super CPU. Uh, I'm not saying there's nobody in the world who can do it, but so far, nobody with the motivation and skill set has been found uh to make a new super cpu i remember um when when there was like loads of hacking on the super cpu i don't know if this was before jerry a game came out called metal dust and it had like a a german band singing the soundtrack oh yeah like a mad kind of um (laughs) new new wave symphony kind of thing it was a they, they released a whole video and stuff it was really hyped Yes. Yeah. Metal dust. Yeah. I, I demonstrated that in one of my videos towards the end. And I think it's well earned earned ball. I can't say it. It's yeah. Sermon. Yeah. Well, an earned ball. Yeah. Well, an earned yeah. ball. <laughs> uh, yeah. They did the soundtrack for it and yeah, it, it's pretty amazing. And it gives an idea of what a super CPU game could be. Uh, I was actually working on my own super CPU dedicated game, uh, I had created the basic engine for it, which would be a mist like game, uh, showing, uh, very high res, colorful iFly pictures on the Commerce 64 with a working mouse pointer and, uh, digital audio that was being mixed real time. I had the basic technology of it done, but then I stalled out for, oh, I don't know, motivation in real life or whatever, uh, I still have, you guys probably have projects that you abandoned and keep thinking, oh, I want to get back to that. And then the years. Thousands. Slip. So many. Yeah, yeah the years. <laughs> Draws <slip by>. full. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. So for me, it's one of those things, but I still keep that in my mind uh, as something I'd, I'd like to achieve. <laughs> well, speaking of your projects, I mean, tell us about your titles, um, Minima and Splatform. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Those are just. Uh, Originally, those were C64 games I coded in 2001, 2002, 3. Uh, and Splatform was a 1K C64 game, uh, nine procedurally generated 
simple platform levels and the goal was to squeeze into 1k for a competition and then minima was a is an arp um is a role-playing game that squeezes into 2k complete with like an overworld and music and so on so that was on the c64 and uh yeah i, I won these little co- contests with that and then when I got into iPhone development, I decided to recreate those games uh, with my partner, Sam uh, Washburn Pixel Games. Uh, we recreated those for iOS and we did have an Android version for a while. Uh, so those were fun, kind of more full realizations of those games. Well, the thing, I really enjoyed a video that you did uh, where you were loading a C64 video game off final. And I notice <laughs> there's kind of a trend at the moment. Uh, LGR just did one off uh, Real to Real. <laughs> Do you think uh, <laughs> there's going to be more unusual forms of kind of loading games? You know, maybe one day someone will do a biscuit or <laughs> something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's definitely a trend. Uh, the uh, Actually, I'm talking to a guy right now who's about to release a – a vinyl out al- like his album of music that will also have code on it and he's been talking to me for a bit of advice uh i'll probably show that on my channel i think he's going to send me a copy of it and yeah it, it's pretty interesting that I, I got into that because of i made it my most popular video has about three quarters of a million views now and it's about a hidden uh like a, a an American Christian rock band from 1984 hit a Commodore 64 program on the runout groove and nobody had ever uh, really documented it. And I just, I was just doing research. I'm into, you know, weird, obscure Easter eggs and this sort of thing. I found a bit of information about it, but nobody had documented. So I, I bought a copy of that record off of Discogs for like, well, I don't know nothing like for, you know, a couple bucks or whatever. Um, and managed to pull the code off. It's a quote. Uh, it's, there's a quote from Jesus and a quote from Einstein. And it was kind of tying in with the theme of that album. Um, so I know it's all kind of weird, <laughs> but anyway, I, I didn't know what my viewers would make of it when I, when I released that, I thought, Oh, people are going to hate this. This is so weird. And it took off and it just totally went viral. I was getting interviewed by uh, a couple magazines and stuff because it was just so big. Um, <laughs> so you never know. Yeah, that's when I discovered your channel when I saw that. And cool. again, it's like, I think it's just those videos that are out there that, you know, no one else has done before. <laughs> and I know that's getting harder and harder to do as, you know, time goes on. But yeah. when you do discover things like that, I mean, people are so into yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. These really neat little mysteries uh and uh the the best part of that story was that the the singer of that band has passed away but his son who's probably about my age his 40s uh always heard his dad talk about that like it was like you know this hilarious fun secret that they had done uh so the son knew about it but had never seen it so he left a comment on my video about how great this was to finally you know his deceased father to finally get to see this thing he had talked about the family legend for years and that was just like to me the greatest oh, wow. part of uh and, and so yeah I've, I've had conversations with him since and the guitarist in that band is still alive and he's become a friend of mine i've talked to him uh so it's just really neat the people that you can meet uh making these videos well, I mean, obviously, back then, I mean, the world was very different in terms of we had different machines in different parts of the world. Like, you know, you mentioned you had the pet at school. We had the Acorn BBC Micros. I mean, have you got any plans of kind of maybe branching out into stuff like that from other countries and exploring them? And Oh, yeah, of yeah, definitely. Like, even for me, having the Apple computers on my channel is branching out a little. But, yeah, definitely, I I have a couple MSX machines now uh, that I'm learning – learning about i have a bbc i think it's the master is that is that the correct term yeah, um, yeah. and try to think oh and i have a auric now that i haven't shown on the channel yet i'm excited about the auric because it's like a spectrum but with a 6502 so yeah i, I definitely like to get into those other machines have you ever seen the uh, agat which is a, a russian uh, clone of the apple II and the 64 
<laughs> oh, a, a Russian clone of the 64? Did yeah, you say? yeah. No, what? <laughs> <laughs> that, heard... that would be an interesting one to do. Uh, it's, yeah. it's mainly an Apple II, but uh, yeah, it, it does Is it both. both and a 64 yeah, and an Apple yeah. II? Wow. Really? Okay, yeah. No, I've heard of Russian Apple II and, of course, Spectrum clones, but, yeah. but I've never heard of any that are like a C64. I will, that could be an interesting I one. I will have to look that up. <laughs> Well, Robin, honestly, this has been such an interesting hour chat. We could do like another two or three hours oh, yeah. <laughs> easy with you. <laughs> but yeah, sorry, I went. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> uh, what, what's kind of coming up on your channel then? Obviously, I'll put a link to it in the show notes. Yeah, the I've got, oh, I've, I'm surrounded by projects here. What's going to be next? Uh, I'm going to do one about cassette use in North America because uh, there's been a growing trend for people to say, to think that only the UK really embrace cassette. But actually, cassette was huge here as well. But then we transitioned to disc around 84, 85. So anyway, I'm going to explore cassette use from the PET into the early C64 days here in Canada and the US. Because some PETs had like cassette drives built into them, didn't oh, they? Oh, yeah. And the VIC-20 mm. was totally cassette. And then this is the the part people really don't know about is when the C64 came out, many people bought it and kept using their cassette drive from the VIC or PET. And there was commercial software for the 64 uh, here in North America on cassette. So anyway, that's what this video is going to be about, just to kind of uh, awaken people to this bit of history that's been lost. Oh,